Let's pray. Father, this morning as we come, we come in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We come humbly bowed before the throne of grace, offering honor and praise and glory to our God. Father, you have been so gracious, so merciful, so compassionate and caring. Lord, we love you. But the love that we have from you actually came from you. The scriptures tell us you loved us first, and we know that. You loved us by giving us your son, Jesus Christ, as a personal Savior. As a Savior that saved each one of us who called upon the name of Jesus Christ who repented of their sins and who tries the best to walk day by day in the shadows, in the footsteps, in the paths of a sinless and perfect God. Lord, we praise you today. We thank you today. We come, Father, repenting of sin that may be in our life that we refuse to acknowledge or we have hidden out of sight, but nothing is hidden from the Almighty God. So we pray, Lord, that you speak to us through your sweet Holy Spirit. Reveal to us things that we should talk to you about, to repent of. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that you offer, the second chance the opportunity to praise you and worship you and live with you. Father, today as we come, it's Memorial Day weekend. It's that time of the year that uh, we pause to remember those men and women who have selflessly laid their life down for a great country, a great cause. Father, many have died, most probably have died on foreign fields trying to preserve the freedoms of this country and establish freedoms for other countries. Oh God, we don't even know how to thank you for the lives of those men and women because we don't understand even though many have served Many have not laid their life down the ultimate sacrifice. Lord, we also thank you for those families that many widows and moms and dads that their sons and daughters have gone on to be with you that paid that price. But today they live on with memories of those men and women. We ask you on this day especially to be with them to comfort them to give them the praise that they deserve because they paid a price too to give up that son or daughter that they loved. And Father, we live now in a time that we have never been before. A time of uncertainty and we're not sure where we're headed unless we know you as their personal Savior, as our personal Savior where this situation is going to take us. People are trying to figure it out moment by moment, step by step. And there too is another group of people. Some have already died trying to help others. Some are still studying the problems and trying to establish the cause. And I pray, Father, that you bless them. Father, we thank you for the safety of our own congregation here. We thank you, Lord, that you have kept us safe. You have given us instructions that we can follow, and if we will follow, we have a good chance of being safe. 
thank you for those men and women that use the knowledge that you give them and relate it on to us. Lord, when we begin to pray and praise and thank you, Lord, we have so much. And all wisdom and all love comes from you. So, Lord, I pray, Father, for another wisdom. Pray for the guidance, Lord, as we prepare to open our doors back again. And Lord, I ask you to give us guidance that we will keep people safe, that we'll practice things that will be good. But oh, how good it'll be to be among our congregation, to be back as our family, to be in your presence, to worship you and praise you. Lord, we pray for our country. Father, it's in a total chaos mess. Father, I pray for the leaders of this nation. George Washington himself said, without God and without the Bible, we have no chance. Father, I pray that these people will get down on their knees. Daniel Webster led our Congress one time to a prayer time that was a session that restored continuity within our own leadership. Father, let someone step forward to take that leadership role. Father, today we have come to pay honor and tribute to men and women while praising you. Oh, Heavenly Father, we have so much to be thankful for. We ask you in this service to guide us with your Holy Spirit that each song that's sung, each prayer that's prayed, and each word of the God, the God's word spoken will be directly from your Holy Spirit. Will be received by open hearts. That even though we may be small numerically, but we're big when it comes to God. Lord, let you be honored and glorified in all that's said and done here. We give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning and welcome to what will be our Memorial Day service. Uh, it's that time of the year that we stop and we reflect on those, in particular, those persons that have given their life. It's been a while since I looked for the numbers, but the last time I looked at the numbers, there was like 1.8 million people, men and women, that had paid the ultimate sacrifice from the beginnings of the wars or skirmishes or whatever you wanted to call them, has paid that price. And I'm sure that that number has grown since. But today we want to pay tribute to them and I want to pay tribute to those families today that are still living that has lost uh, service members uh, in service to this country. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tribute. It's an honor to have been a part of that military group but there's nothing like those that have laid their life down. We just can't imagine. So to those families that remain, we thank you for the tribute that you have made and how you deal with it today, day by day. So we want to honor you all today. We have a, just, uh, I think, one announcement I hope you'll be pleased with. Um, on the 7th of June at 11 a.m. in the morning, we will resume services here with open doors. Uh, we will put out some guidance on what the CDC and uh, the governor's office and the local mayor's office uh, uh, seems to think would be our 
best opportunity to provide a safe environment. But the ultimate is going to be left up to you. I do want to say, and we will say several times by email and so forth, you need to make smart judgments and right judgments. Uh, I, I would never hate, I would never want to tell anyone, don't come to church. But I'm saying to you, if you have any of the symptoms that we've become very familiar with, I would suggest that you stay home. We will continue to provide the videos as we have. We will continue to be on Facebook and those social medias that we have been blessed to have. But if you have any of those symptoms, uh, I would suggest that you stay home and enjoy the services in the comfort of your home. Uh, there will be some things that we will have to do when you come to church uh, to make, uh, uh, make sure that uh, everyone is safe. And so uh, at this point, that's all I have on that. I do want to say uh, that uh, we will not start Sunday school nor night services at this time. However, here is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I said our services will begin at 11 in the morning, and that will be. But at 10.15, from 10.15 to 10.45, we will have prayer time. If you would come in early, if you'd like to come and pray, uh, from the doors will be open at 10.15, and we will have a prayer time setting that uh, we can come, you can pray privately, you can pray with someone, and so uh, I think that it will be a joyous time that uh, uh, we can just come together with God before we begin to worship Him and, uh, and pray for the situations. And just there's plenty to pray for. So uh, uh, that will begin at 10.15 in the morning till 10.45. And so we'll have more on that. And so uh, that's all the announcements I have this morning. And so uh, we will continue to worship. God bless you. <clears throat> the 
people that was wounded, he was taking belts off of the dead service members and applying tourniquets to those that had severe wounds and so forth. And for that, uh, he and he was wounded himself. Uh, one sh one uh, round of ammo hit the ship and knocked him down three decks of the ship and uh, severe burns and so forth. And but uh, and I won't go into the whole story because it is quite interesting. If you just go on Google, uh, youngest service member to serve, you'll see the story of this young man. Uh, but when they took him to a hospital and uh, for recovery, uh, they discovered his age and he wound up being put in the brig for <clears throat> falsifying his uh, <laughs> records and uh, spent three months in the brig. And uh, the awards that he was awarded, the recognition he was awarded, uh, some of them were withdrawn, and over a period of years and years, uh, they gave him awards, took them away from him. Finally, when Reagan was in office, when President Reagan was in office, uh, he restored all those medals to his family member. He actually died of a heart attack in 1992. So I, I just thought that was interesting, and so uh, anyway, uh, what a thought. In April 1963 in Columbus, Mississippi, after decorating the um, graves of two sons, an elderly mother went to the north corner of the cemetery and began to put decorations on two mounds of earth. And another person who had come to decorate some called out to the lady and said, hey, those were northern soldiers. Why are you decorating those? And this mother said, yes, I understand that. But I also know that there's possibly a young wife and a mother who is mourning as we mourn today. It's quite a tribute that when you have served in war, the enemy is not the enemy. The political situation is the enemy. Amen. You see, when two different members of separate military functions come face to face. They have never seen each other before, probably. They've never had contact with each other. But some people have the idea that the American service mem member hates the foreign member. That's not the case. You see, we're doing battle over issues. We're not doing battle over personal grievances. When this lady was decorating the gravesite of the northern service member, when that story began to circulate was actually the foundation. And even though Memorial Day was not designated until some years later, that was the first thoughts of having a Memorial Day for all service members. Out on Fort Campbell in the back area, not in the back area, but actually out toward the front main side of the post, there are five German prisoners of war buried that died there at Fort Campbell. And there is tribute paid on Memorial Day to the grave sites of those what we would call enemy soldiers. They were soldiers doing their job what soldiers do. Memorial Day is set aside each year to remember those who gave their lives for the armed forces. 
And I said earlier, the latest statistics I've seen is about 1.8 million Americans have made that tribute, and that statistics is a few years old. We remember those who died away in battlefields to bring freedom and democracy to a depressed group of people. We commemorate their actions by honoring them and serving is across the country. In times past, we have called that Decoration Day because it was a day when, in those days, that communities gathered in the local cemetery and pay tribute to all the dead and all the family members with special recommendation. Let that word sink in. With special ceremonies for those service members who died for the country. So on Memorial Day, we remember those who have gone on before. Many have been buried in foreign cemeteries. Those of World War II we seem to remember most. But there are American service persons scattered throughout the world. There are prisoners of war that still are unaccounted for body-wise. We never forget any of them. But the family member has not family members have not been able to what we call closure to be able to have their remains to return to their country and that we pay proper tribute to having a burial service and to have them to come and reside in their homeland. We need to remember those who have died for the cause of this country. It was once said that if we don't remember the freedoms and the rights we have as a nation of people, those things and these who died in battle to preserve, if we do not remember those things, then they died in vain. Let no person ever die in vain. So when I have my sermon title of what does Christ mean to us, it should provoke a thought of what Christ has done for you and I. He died for you and I. Amen. And this passage is in Joshua chapter 4 talks about a memorial service, if you will. One great event that God gave the Israelite people. And I want to use that same thought process to remind us to think about what Christ has done for you and I. And we remember and honor those who died for our country. Let us praise our living Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us but was resurrected. So our reference to our local passage about the stones of the Israelites, place to remember God work to work. We also have the remembrance to remind us of what Christ did for us. We have memorial stones also. We have a cemetery full of them. A few years ago, I had the honor and privilege of visiting Arlington Cemetery along with some other uh, military persons. It was a humbling sight to walk down the walkways and to see countless crosses, each one representing the hero of our country, the person who had died, had the privilege of attending the service at the tomb of the unknown soldier. We have memorial stones around us. We choose this day to look back on the past, to see where we've been, but also to look forward to where we're going. 
a great philosopher of the past, George Santayana, was quoted in saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. There's a lot of truth in that statement. What is that we remember in our question this morning? Are we faithful to passing on our memories to those that we're responsible for? As I think about these men and women who came before us and many have went on, made it possible for us to enjoy the freedoms that we have, that we have one thing stuck with me this morning as I prepared this sermon. These people were simple people. While they did some extraordinary things, some special things, there was nothing extraordinary about those people. They were just simple people living just like you and I, but driven by love for God and family and country. I want to share the thoughts of just one of those persons. There were many. The Patrick Henry was one of those many simple persons. He was a famous statesman and orator from Colonial Virginia. In 1764, he was elected to the House of Burgesses, where he became a champion for frontier people, supporting their rights against the arrogant exercise of power by rich and famous, and we would say, sort of arist aristocrats. I choose too many big words. I'll just leave those out. In 1774, he was a delegate for the First Continental Congress. 1775, before the Virginia Provincial Convention, which was deeply divided between those who supported England and those who desired freedom, he uttered those famous words, Give me liberty, give me death. During the Revolutionary War, he became the Commander-in-Chief for Virginia's military forces and as a member of the Second Continental Congress, helped draw up the first con Constitution for the Commonwealth of Virginia. He was largely responsible for drawing up the amendments to the Constitution that today we know as the Bill of Rights. He became Virginia's first governor and was re-elected four times. When he retired from public office, but despite strong objections to people when he had re-elected him governor for the fifth term, but he meant what he said and he refused to take office. He was offered a seat in the U.S. Senate and post as ambassador to Spain and France. President George Washington asked him to join the cabinet and become a secretary of state. Later, President Washington wanted him to appoint him the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but he refused all such honors and recognitions. When he declined all of those positions, here's what he said. It cannot be emphasized, this is a quote, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that. End quote. His last will and testament is filed in Brookneal County Courthouse in Virginia. It can be read. You'll see bequeathed everything to his children, just as most people do. But the last paragraph of his will is especially interesting. He wrote, quote, I have now given everything I own to my children. There is one more thing I wish I could give them, and that is Jesus Christ. Because if they have everything I gave them and don't have Christ, they have nothing. End quote. You see, this man, Patrick Henry, Henry, even though well known and became well recognized for his leadership, I refuse to shoot, use the word political, but his leadership, uh, he was still a simple man. He loved foremost his 
Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But he also loved his country and he loved his family. Let me share with you the passage of Scripture, Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And it came to pass when all the people were clean and they had passed over Jordan, and the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people and out of every tribe and man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. And then Joshua called twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan. Take you up every man of you a stone upon your shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. And this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their father in times to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? And then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and when it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the middle of Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests which were the Ark of the Covenant stood and they are there unto this day. Lord, we thank you for memorials. We thank you for reminding us. Lord, let us be those to remind our children, and those that we come in contact of what you did for us. We thank you again for the men and women who have died serving this great country. Lord, we ask you to teach us and remind us what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did for us. Let us praise you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So our passage today is God is directing the people to remember the Israelites had just wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And all of those adults who entered or who had left the exodus of Egypt 40 years ago, all have now died except two, Joshua and Caleb. The memories of Egypt was fading. I submit to you today the great times of our great countries have passed. Sometimes the hard times. The wars have passed. The economic times of the past. The tragedies have passed. We have lived in good times. Now we live in a worldwide pandemic. But we have come to a point that those times that brought us to this point has faded with the past. I'm not one to be prophetic or to try to make the situation fit the Bible. I don't believe in that. But but sometimes we need to look at the situation and say, maybe God is just trying to tell us something. I was
was speaking with a person on the phone today about a family situation, health issues. And we were talking about how for the last two months, basically, there has been no church. And I said to him, I said, you know, when you stop and think about it, a lot of people gave up on church years ago. Numbers have annually declined on attendance in church. I said to him in speculation and not trying to guess what God is trying to say, maybe God is just saying, if you don't want church, I'll take church away from you. Now that's Jess's thought. That's not Biblical, I don't try to back it up with scripture, but sometimes God said to the nation of Israel when He said to them uh, that they were to have judges as their leaders, and the nation of Israel says, No, our neighbor over here has got kings. We want a king, we want somebody of royalty, we want someone that we can parade in front of us. And, and really be a spokesperson for our country. We want that. And after some deliberation between God and the people of Israel, and Israel just said, no, we're going to have a king. God said, have it your way. And other than just a few of the kings that they had appointed to them, the most part they led, the, church, led the, the nation of Israel into captivity and into bondage and into trouble sometimes. Sometimes we give up on things that God has given us that is a luxury. And we take it as a challenge and we take it as a problem to get up on Sunday morning and just come to church to worship to fellowship, to praise God. That's not even part of my message, but it just comes up as a thought. But the memories of Egypt to the Israelite people was beginning to fade. Moses had died, and now Joshua was the leader, and after all these people, after all these 40 years, they were about to enter this promised land. But there before them stood a big obstacle. You see, folks, there will always be obstacles in our path that when we are trying to follow God or to do what God wants, there will always be an obstacle, but the obstacle is God's problem and not my problem or your problem. What we need to do is say, God, if you expect me to do what you want done, then you will have to take care of that obstacle. You see, the nation of Israel uh, looked there and they seen it. as they approached the Jordan River, all they saw was a swelling water and, and it was not a dry time of the season. It was a time of floods and so forth. And they looked and said, what do I do? God says, let me handle that. He said, Joshua, take the, take, take the, uh, the priest and Take the Ark of the Covenant and, and, and go out in front of the people for a distance and take your, and go there. And then he says, priest, step into the water. Folks, sometimes by faith we have to step into the rushing water and sometimes we have to just take maybe a chance that God has got it. The priest took the Ark of the Covenant and they walked out into the swollen waters. If you study that historically, there is documentation that the Jordan River backed up for seven miles up the river. And the water piled up. And 
and all those people. 200,000, I won't quote that because my numbers is getting jumbled here, crossed on dry land. Let's go back and look quickly at Joshua chapter 4. Look at verse 4 and 5, and, by, and the Bible says, Then Joshua called the twelve moon men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulders according to the number of the tribes of Israel. So God commanded Joshua to gather those twelve stones up as they crossed over and placed them at their first encampment after they reached across Jordan there. And that happens to be a place called Gilgal that when you read it in the Bible, and it just happens to mean circle of stones. You see, God's got it. And from these stones they built a memorial that would serve as a vivid remember, reminder to all of those around us. What do we have as reminders? The first thing we have as a reminder is the Bible. We have God's holy word. We have the cross. It's a reminder of God's sacrifice of his son who died on the cross, an old cruel, cruel cross. We have a Lord's Supper. What does the table say down there in front of us, right in front of us? Those words do in remembrance of me as a reminder. We have baptism. It reminds us, reminds us of the death, resurrection uh, of Christ and who died to self and is resurrected in you and I that when we accept Christ as our personal Savior, we die to self and we rise again. We have a pulpit that reminds us of the centrality of God's Word in our lives. But here's the verse that I want you to remember. In Joshua chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, the Bible says that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to say, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer to them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and when it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. When your children ask, what do these stones mean? We're to be able to answer it. Today we live in a day and age that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is not discussed very much. We wonder why our churches are empty. We wonder why our homes are broken down. We wonder why there are shootings in our school. We wonder why the youth suicide rate is is out of the sight. We have failed to teach those as we were taught. In Joshua chapter 4 verse 21, the Bible says, and he spoke to the children of Israel and he said again, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God had dried up the waters of Jordan before unto you, had crossed over, and the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us, and he we had crossed over. The Bible says, Fathers, we are responsible. It doesn't say go ask the Sunday school teacher, don't go ask the preacher, don't go ask somebody uh, that you think might ask. So you're to be able to describe it to them. And we have failed in a lot of ways. We as a nation have forgotten and failed to teach our children to remember those things. And the Mayfire Compact, that document that we studied in, in social studies and history class, has these words. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, and the honor of our king and country. We need to remember people like George Washington, the first president, who kept a prayer journal that he entitled Daily Sacrifice. 
One quote from President Washington concerning a nation, he said this, It is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. Amen. Our Declaration of Independence, a document that was declared, Us a Nation, has these words written in it. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these things life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. We could go on and on. And we as Christians in the church sometimes have failed to remind and to teach. Consider these thoughts here in these timelines. 1954, our churches began to grow silent on issues of the time. In 1963, the Bible and prayer was beginning to be removed from our school system. 1965, sexual revolution was in full force. 1973, the Supreme Court found a solution to all unwanted consequences of sexual revolution and handed down the famous Roe versus Wade. 1980, the Ten Commandments were being removed from public square. And let me add to this, just this week, now the media is trying to convince people that Jane Roe, Roe versus Wade, Jane Roe, uh, uh, was, didn't really make, in her final days or her final uh, time on this earth, she had become a Christian. And she acknowledged that, in fact, she even tried to get Congress to reverse uh, her support to uh, uh, abortion back in the day. And they would, not, they would not do it. And now the media, this past week, uh, has tried to convolute the, the fact that she, she didn't really say that. She was coerced and she was politically bought off and all this other stuff. I got a famous word for that, and it's called belonging. I saw her speak on the steps in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and explain her position when the abortion rights back in 1985, mid-80s, early 80s, when there was a lot going on at that time, and she came to Baton Rouge and we took our Christian school, high school students from our Christian school down there to hear her speak. And there was no question in her mind of how she felt and what she had learned from her experiences. But we're no longer taught that we are fearfully and wonderful made by a loving creator, God, for a divine purpose. I want you to know, folks, you weren't just planted here, you just happened to show up. God put you here for a purpose. And it is a divine purpose. On this Memorial Day, we need to remember what people have done for us. They've given us time and energy. Many, their very life. Let's not forget what it costs to give us this freedom to worship the Lord Jesus Christ openly and without fear. We as a church have got to be more bold and standing for the things that we believe in. So what are we going to do to remind this next generation. Many of us have grandchildren that is growing of the age that needs to be taught. We can't make the school school the system teach nothing. But I can take my 11-year-old granddaughter and sit down and talk to her about things that I personally know about, I have seen in my lifetime that might preserve one generation of people. Where does it begin? I believe it begins in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. So when your children or your grandchildren ask you, or your neighbor asks you, or your co-worker or someone asks you, what does Jesus mean to you? How will you answer? What will your answer be? 
I sent a devotion of sort out last night that talks a lot about the plan of salvation. I urge us to study that because it gives us the answers that when we have someone come to us and say, who is this person Jesus? And what does he mean to you? Let us be able to answer. If we can help you, you can call the church at 931-648-9502. Leave your name and number and a message and we will be more than happy to get back with you. God bless you. Father, we thank you for this time, this day. We thank you for your scriptures. But most of all, we thank you for the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have your will way in this service, and we'll praise you for whatever you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.